I think we were warned yesterday never to get on stage with a robot. No one listened to that advice. Um, so um, let me tell you who's joining us today to talk about robots' um, roles in uh, healthcare and uh, what's coming up in the future. Uh, to my far left is Dr. Daniel Kraft. He's uh, the Medicine and Neuroscience Chair at Singularity University, an all-around visionary in digital health. And in keeping with the theme uh, today, he's coming to us uh, via a telepresence robot from the South Bay. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Catherine Moore. She's Vice President of Medical Research at Intuitive Surgical. And Dr. Corey Kidd is CEO and founder of Intuitive Automata and is a leader in social robotics, no relation between the two uh, intuitive <laughs> names. Um, well, let's start with our robot here. Um, I imagine, tell us what other sort of, what sort of healthcare related applications besides being able to be in two places at once when, um, when you've double booked conferences, what else can you do uh, in the healthcare realm with, with these telepresence robots? Well, I think it's, it's pretty amazing that I'm, I'm very easily just logging into my laptop here and able to appear and interact with you super, in a super sort of fine, fine sense. I think it's much more than just having a Skype session. And I think in the clinical realm, this will have increasing applications. There are already versions of this type of beam robot that are being used to round in hospitals, to visit nursing homes, to visit loved ones. And I think, you know, this is just the beginning of just the telepresence element as a start. So I can look around the room here. I can have a lot of the same fidelity as I'd have being face to face, but I can even augment this element. So for example, I might use the camera on this to pick up your heart rate or your emotional state or um, bring in other uh, telemedited uh, information. I can almost get Captain's pulse. Uh, <laughs> So I think the role of, of robotics is going to go beyond just the telepresence realm uh, to the point where these become augmented devices. They're going to change in quality. It won't just be the, the telepresent uh, visit. It'll be the, the robots that you ingest, like holding a, an eye pill, which is sort of a, a swallowable robot in a sense. And I think um, with the exponential decrease in power, in, exponential you know, increase in the potential and the decreasing cost in these, we'll see these uh, become quite ubiqu ubiquitous in healthcare blended with telemedicine. Okay, great. I'm going to have you face the audience a little more so the folks over here on the left can see you too. Um, so, and, and we'll talk a little about uh, telepresence uh, in robotic surgery as well in a moment. But first, how many folks, uh, yeah, totally upstaged by the robot. They were right yesterday. Um, how many people heard about the, the desktop companion Jibo that was breaking records on Indiegogo last month? Um, well, good, then we have a little bit to talk about here. I, um, Dr. Corey Kidd, Cynthia Brazil, is that her name? She sort of worked uh, with you with, at MIT uh, uh, Media Lab on that. And I'm wondering, is that a social robot, Jibo? And maybe you could explain to all of us what social robots are. Sure, so social robots is still a fairly new term, maybe about 10 years old now, and I think of it as something that understands something about social interaction. So either understanding you know, what people that, are, that a robot is interacting with are doing, you know, maybe where we're looking, how we're talking, or the opposite, so being able to use social cues and interaction. So it's a fairly broad term. And, well, so um, what does a social robot tend to look like, and why is that better than sort of a person, human being? So a couple questions here. What does it look like? I think there's a broad range of answers. I mean, there's all sorts of different robots, and I think that you know, even among the three panelists, we're talking about very different types of robots here. If you want to see one of the robots that I've built and kind of the foundation for the stuff I'm talking about, I don't think we have a picture up here, but I tweeted it. So if you look at HiSum about five minutes ago, uh, there's a picture of uh, a cute, about 16 inch tall, 27 centimeter tall uh, social robot that sits on a countertop. And that one has uh, big eyes and looks at you, makes eye contact while it's talking with you. Uh, and as far as why they're good, it really depends on the application. You know? And I think that reflects uh, similarly to how we're talking about different things here. We're talking about very different designs of robots. So in some cases, a robot that can look at you and make eye contact uh, can be very engaging, and that can be very valuable. In other cases, you might want a very different form factor and look of a robot. But what purpose does, do social robots play? I mean, it's sort of, I can see it sort of maybe as a companion, caregiver, 
elderly and loneliness and that build on that. I mean, what? Well, what I think there are a lot of applications. So when I started working in interactive robots about uh, 12 or 13 years ago, the perspective I took was really about the psychology of interaction. So understanding what happens when we as people interact with a robot and how that's similar or different than interacting with something on a screen. And the really quick summary of a couple of years of studies was that people are more engaged with interacting with a physical robot. Uh, as opposed to something that's just on a screen. And they're engaged for much longer. And that thing is also better at conveying information when you compare it to something on a screen. And this is exactly the same thing that we find about face-to-face -face versus mediated interaction. So, you know, despite Daniel attracting a lot of attention here, I think there are some challenges in, you know, using these interactions in some cases. So in cases where we care about that long-term engagement or, you know, being able to effectively convey information, we want that face-to-face you know, and I think that you know, this kind of technology that we see here is great for a lot of applications. So it really comes down to what we're trying to do with it rather than starting with the robot and figuring out where it's good, really starting with the healthcare outcomes and seeing what technology is appropriate. So the photo you sent, is that of Autumn, the robot that you were yes, working with? Okay, tell us a little about what Autumn does. Sure, so the focus that I've had over the last decade is on uh, long-term behavior change. So how do we engage someone and help them stick with something for a long period of time? So Autumn is a product that we built uh, at my last company, Intuitive Automata, as a weight loss coach. So to help engage someone uh, and help keep track of eating exercise and coach them to stick with a diet for a long period of time. Okay, so that would that fall under sort of prevention uses? Yes, in general, so uh -huh. that's, that's more prevention. Some of the other applications that we're looking at are around, you know, making sure someone takes their medication or manages a chronic condition. So, you know, if we look at across a lot of our healthcare challenges right now, medically we may know, you know, what we should be doing but behaviorally, and we've already heard about this today and yesterday, behaviorally it's a real challenge to get us as people to stick with something for a long period of time, even if we know it's good for us. And so, um, now, we, there aren't a lot of consumer examples sort of of robots. There's, um, well, Jibo, this, uh, this uh, desktop robot that I guess people are gonna start seeing more of, and there's the Zumba vacuum cleaner, or whatever it's called, that we were talking about briefly yesterday. I mean, I can't think of a lot of examples. So I think partly people are just unfamiliar with, uh, because th there aren't a lot of robots in the consumer realm. Um, and then there's sometimes a little stigma around robots too, and judgment, so um, it's a hard life being a robot. But, um, so talk about that a little. Um, is that something you find with the idea of social robots as, you know, companions or? You know, I think there's actually quite a bit of acceptance when people see them. You know, if you looked at the picture of Autumn, you'll see it's very cute. You know, I think that 10 years ago, it was a lot harder to talk about this. You know, the common idea of a robot uh, came from Hollywood, and it was probably the Terminator, not exactly a friendly, cuddly robot. Today, when people see our robot, you know, they think of other Hollywood examples, like WALL-E, for example, so something that's much cuter. Or if anyone's seen the movie Robot and Frank, or there's uh, you know, several other examples in the last few years of robots that, uh, have a much warmer, friendlier uh, connotation around them. And so I think that when people see these, particularly when we introduce robots that are around a particular application to help me do something, it's a different mindset than what it might have been a few years ago. So I can see sort of social robots are used sort of in the prevention area and rehab area, but then we jump over to sort of the other end, which is intervention, and we can get into sort of uh, robotics and surgery. I think that's sort of you're at the other end of the, <laughs> the spectrum there. The other extreme, there. that's for yeah. sure. Well, tell us a little bit about why, like, what, why would you use robotics rather than the old-fashioned way of using your hands? And tell us what it looks like, robotic surgery. Okay, yeah, and, and I think your characterization of it really being the other extreme of robotics is, is accurate. When we think of robots, we tend to think of something that's autonomous, something that we're interacting with, something that's separate. And when we look at robotic technology, it's really sensors and actuators and the ability to process information and have you know, artificial intelligence on board or not. So a surgical robot is not autonomous. It, it's really instead an extension of the surgeon. It's allowing the surgeon to do surgery through incisions that are much, much smaller than they could ever get their hand through. And it allows them to see tissue in a way that their eyes would never be able to see because we can put cameras in that are sensitive to wavelengths that the human eye isn't sensitive to. And so what it allows surgeons to do essentially is to take on a set of superpowers 
kind of the ability to reach in with smaller, uh, you know, being able to make small microscopic movements, lots of dexterity, takes the tremor out and allows them to see tissue and navigate and have overlays of additional information so that during a surgery they can be making better clinical decisions. But when you think about who's the customer and, you know, who's the consumer, we have an unusual product in that our customer, the patient, is anesthetized when they're interacting with our product. Um, and so they never really interact with it in a way that they would with sort of a, an autonomous companion robot. So, um, and you work with something called uh, Da Vinci. Da Vinci, right? Da Vinci yeah, uh, over at Intuitive robot. Surgical. So, what does that look like? Are you in another room looking in? We, we didn't get to show you a video, um, but is it in your TED Talk, by the way, a little example yes, of that? Yes, it is. Okay, she has a great TED Talk, by the way, I'd highly recommend. Thank you. But, um, so you're, you're holding, I mean, you're holding, you're not standing there holding the arms right over the patient necessarily, you're further back. Correct. So, the surgeon sits generally not in another room, but they could if you're going to run the fiber optic cable into another room. But the, the, the surgeon sits at a console, and they are manipulating a, a controller that essentially measures the position of where their hand is and the state of their grip. So it knows what their motions are. That, it then translates that into surrogate little metal hands that are now inside the patient. And so the robot what people think of when they think of the Da Vinci is mostly the patient side cart, the, the part of the robot that is holding the surgical instruments and is allowing that manipulation to happen inside the body. And so the surgeon is really telepresent in a lot of ways, telepresent almost in the way that Daniel is right now. Um, he's telepresent from the South Bay up to here. The surgeon is telepresent from sitting next to the patient to being inside the patient. They see, they manipulate, they, it is like they are inside the patient. And so they can then do operations on a very microscopic scale without having to go through a big incision. And so are there some surgeries that are now standard uh, to use robotics in, and what would those be? Well, so one of the very early areas where the da Vinci was adopted was in prostate cancer surgery, or prostatectomy. And in about 15 years ago, 4% of those surgeries were being done minimally invasively. That was largely laparoscopically. Today, 90% of those surgeries are being done minimally invasively. And so that means 90% of men who are getting a prostate cancer surgery are going home with little Band-Aids on their belly rather than a large midline incision. We've seen it grow similarly in cancer hysterectomy um, mostly in areas where the, there's a gap. We want to be able to give patients minimally invasive surgery, but the surgeries are too complex to be done with traditional minimally invasive techniques such as laparoscopy. And so we've seen this growth in areas where it's displacing open surgery in these very complex types of surgeries. So uh, in this talk I was referring to, you mentioned that you can do things like um, bypass blood vessels and, you know, perform heart surgery without having to crack the chest. And I mean, that stuff sounds kind of um, pretty impressive. And I'm just wondering why we're not doing that all the time. I assume it's cost. Well, no, uh, there's a law in, in the heart surgery. There's actually quite a few mitral valve replacement surgeries that are being done and it hasn't gotten to full standard of care in mitral valve, but it is, it is moving in that direction. Um, whenever you have any kind of a new technology that you bring out, there's a learning curve and there's an adoption curve that, ha I mean, people don't change habits overnight. They, d they can't switch over to a new modality immediately. You have the people who rush out and say, oh, this is really exciting, I wanna try it. And then you have the people that sort of follow along and, and do it a little bit later. And then you've got the people who are very resistant at the end. And things like heart surgery are large team efforts. And it's not just the surgeon that says, okay, now I wanna bring in a robot and do it robotically. The whole team has to be trained in order to be able to do that well. And so um, the cost part of the, uh, of the equation is generally that using the instruments, using the robot, amortizing it, it adds about $2,000 per case onto the cost of doing a case. 
but that's just inside the operating room. If somebody's then going home in two days instead of in four days, it costs on average $1,500 per day to keep somebody in the hospital. So the hospital gets paid the same amount, whether they're doing a robotic surgery or an open surgery, but they're making the money back because they can send people home earlier. And so the, the cost barriers have not actually been the barriers to adoption. It's been largely just these things gaining traction and gaining <laughs> clinical acceptance in the different surgical societies. Okay, uh, we had a, a pretty bold statement yesterday um, that maybe um, robotic surgery would be standard of care in, in a lot of surgery by, I don't know, what was it, you guys, 40, 50 years from now? Um, do you have any sort of uh, bold statement or prediction of <laughs> what we can expect being a little closer to the technology? Well, given that I'm trying to make that happen, <laughs> yeah. the best way to predict the future is to make it happen. Um, it, there, when, when I look at all of the different kinds of surgeries that we could be bringing robotics into, it's really clear that they're not all da Vinci surgeries. They're, they're, the, the da Vinci surgical robot is really good for things that have sort of a laparoscopic analog. But when we start thinking about knee surgeries, when we start thinking about eye surgeries, when we start thinking about a lot of the other areas where we do surgery, there'll be need to have other robots, do new different purpose-built robots for those different areas of surgery. But I also really believe that augmenting the surgeon in all of those surgical areas, giving them greater precision, giving them uh, navigation, tr taking out tremor, changing the scale, adding in additional information as an overlay so that they can make better clinical decisions, there's a benefit to that in every surgical area. So I think there will be robots everywhere. And as we move over to Daniel, what about uh, telepresence in surgery? Uh, Catherine, um, Catherine or Daniel, wh mm -hmm. wh is that something that's happening? Well, I think when you, I've, I've experienced the Da Vinci device and when you're in it, you're really, and as Catherine said, inside the patient. And I think it's gonna be the convergence of not just the visualization, the ability to control the, the robot's fine movements, but as Catherine was mentioning, the overlapping of, let's say, artificial intelligence to guide you to the tumor or MRI data or CT scan data that shows you where the tumor is or how to avoid the blood vessels. Um, I think, in general, when we think about robotics uh, in healthcare, I would maybe reframe that as all these fast moving areas that can overlap to augment the clinician in the setting of the operating room, in the primary care setting, starting to augment the, the patient in the home, maybe whether that's aging in place. And having a set of robots that are part of your Internet of Things that can keep track of your health and, and allow more proactive uh, prevention of falls or detecting uh, other things before they sort of happen. So I think the OR is a perfect example. We're seeing you know, Google Glass being applied. Things like Oculus Rift have already been demoed uh, as ways for learning anatomy or, 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 or um, as Catherine often talks about, mentoring another surgeon through these devices. So I can be, for example, rounding in a clinic. Uh, I'm a bone marrow transplant physician. I could be in India and on rounds with a team there and helping um, them talk through a difficult case and actually examine the patient. So I think there'll be the blending of the sensibilities. And, and what about other roles just to stick uh, with the operating theater for a moment, um, like anesthesiologists and so forth? Well, there, I'll mention J&J &J &J last fall uh, had approval of a robotic anesthesiologist uh, for conscious sedation for like colonoscopies. And just like many other challenges in healthcare, who do you think is fighting tooth and nail not to let that come into the OR here in the United States? The anesthesiologists, because in some cases, their jobs will be taken by robotic anesthesiologists. We can see apps that can replace dermatologists. We'll see, um, in some cases, maybe the robo full-on surgeon in a few decades, thanks to Catherine and colleagues in work school, will replace uh, members of the team that are already there. Yeah, though, as, as we know in AI, and this is one of my favorite quotes from Danny Hillis, that in AI, the hard problems were easy and the easy problems were hard. And taking the judgment out of the middle of some of these things is, is very difficult. I mean, we've seen even in just trying to get a surgical robot to do automatic suturing, uh, it, it's extremely difficult to, to sort of deal with all of the uncertainty. And humans are really good at making decisions in the face of a lot of uncertainty, but things like, 
like the dermatology app where you're matching what the shape of something looks like to a library of other pictures of what shapes look like, that's much more tractable. Uh, Daniel, you have your um, finger on the pulse of a lot of new innovation. Um, talk to us about some other sort of uh, applications for robotics and healthcare. Uh, I know there's a lot of them, um, like like nanobots, small robots. That sure. would be an interesting I mean, area to start. Just a couple sort of from macro to micro. We're now in the world of, of wearable exoskeleton. Okay, I think we're still there. Yeah, there we are. Back. 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 <laughs> um, so I was mentioning from outside to inside that we're now in the world of wearable exoskeleton or wearable robots. You may have seen the demo at the World Cup where someone quadriplegic. We're seeing that now Berkeley Exobionics has wearable uh, the e legs, which today are for the paralyzed, but in the future may be enabling someone who just has muscle weakness or a stroke to get up and walk. We're seeing, uh, you know, implantable robots in a sense where I mentioned briefly this, you know, the Philips eye pill developed out of Israel is the layering of many convergent technologies that you would swallow. Can this you, one just the, can you show the folks on the other end of the oh, yeah, audience too? Just so everybody can this see. This is just a, 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 let's say a swallowable robot in a sense that can replace an upper endoscopy. Now this one's passive. It's unused as well. Um, you, you can imagine you could use it. Um, but, uh, there are other versions that actually can move through your GI tract and, uh, and potentially then do interventions. So instead of having a, a large colon colonoscope or endoscope uh, down you, you'll have something less invasive. And as we go to the micro level, nanotechnology, we can think about nanorobots that can move through your bloodstream, that can eventually clear out plaques uh, and beyond. So if we're you know, riding the exponential wave, and I chair a conference now called Exponential Medicine, we're looking at where these might be in two or five or ten years. And I think as innovators, we need to be building whatever, whether it's an app or a wearable or a drug, um, how this blends with where our technology will be in, in, let's say, five years. I'm curious for all of you, there, there is this concern about robots, um, you know, uh, taking over people's jobs and so forth, um, or becoming smarter than us. And um, I'm just wondering, you know, how does that, in, I can't imagine that a robot would completely take over a surgeon's uh, job, but how does this impact sort of the, the area of robotics and healthcare at all? Does it, in social robots with caregivers? Well, in, in social robots, I think what we're doing is really trying to augment where we don't have enough people. You know, to take one of our applications where it's a companion that sits at home on my countertop, then that robot is there to talk to me on an everyday basis and kind of remind me to take my medication or take my vitals and, you know, keep track and keep me engaged in between the visits to my doctor or other caregiver. You know, we've had uh, a very strong positive reaction from clinicians uh, from being able to essentially reach out to that patient on a daily basis in between getting to see them every month or two months or six months or whatever it might be. So the kind of technology that we're building is not about replacing people, it's about augmenting what we can already do in healthcare. Yeah, well, and in reducing anxiety of adult caregivers of the elderly who feel like they have to leave their parent for periods of time when they're working. I mean, that's very much, they would like to be there, but they can't. So it's, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I now, think I'll that, mention, yeah, I'll just, I'll just mention, um, and, and first of all, I want to thank uh, Suitable Technologies for lending this Beam robot. But there's a, 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 a consumer version of this going to be coming out that I've ordered, I think I'll be getting later this year, for about $1,500, I believe. And so I think we'll see this type of thing become more social, we'll be in our homes, we can visit our grandparents, uh, we can visit our patients, and, and it'll become like, much more common than we think when we're reaching now these price points that are, you know, $1,000 or so. I'm, I'm just going to, this is sort of similar to the question I just asked, but because it's sort of like trumps all the other questions on here, there's so many people asking, and I'm going to ask again. Um, so uh, lots of folks want to know how we balance the efficiencies and accuracies of robo-docs with the human need for empathy and contact, which gets a little bit of that. But. Well, I mean, when I, when I made the comment that the patient interacts with our robot when they're anesthetized, um, the... the the human contact of the surgeon, the surgeon is still, I mean, some people might debate whether human surgeons demonstrate enough empathy as it is, <laughs> but, um, but there is still that, you know, when, it, when it's time and prevention has failed and surgery is necessary, that the surgeon is the one that is talking with the patient, talking about options, examining them in clinic, 
the, the patient doesn't ever really interact with the robot. And then the surgeon is then seeing them in post-operative clinic, part of their post-operative care. The human connection that was there is still there. The robot is really only changing what the surgeon can do within the confines of the OR. Um, Okay, I have a, oh, sorry, do you want to, did you want to I was just today? saying on the, the social robot side, I think this, you know, is very relevant in that people, you know, do feel a connection to the robot. The kind of core of what we're doing is looking at the psychology of relationships, combining that with artificial intelligence to create this ongoing relationship. And even in the very first trial we did with our weight loss coach about eight years ago, seven years ago, what, one of the challenges of the trial is at the end people wouldn't give the robots back. <laughs> they were talking about them like they were friends or family members, you know, really developed a relationship with it, if you will, spending about four or five minutes a day with it. So people were not confused that this was a human companion or someone that they were, you know, really engaged with. They actually saw it as they were doing something for themselves. So we kind of used the, the ability to create that relationship to make this a more effective tool for someone to help themselves with long-term change. You know, sorry, but what occurs to me is maybe you should make companion robots for surgeons in the, for the office visit, and it can go, hey, you really need to be nicer there. <laughs> Good market. <laughs> um, this question's for Catherine. No hospital has ever demonstrated an ROI for using the Da Vinci uh, robot. Medicare and other major payers refuse to pay for it. How can we continue to innovate if there's no return? So that's an interesting assertion that no hospital has ever demonstrated an ROI. Um, one of the fastest growing areas where robots are being used around the world is in places where there's single payer medicine. Mostly, I mean, some very interesting things came out of uh, Sweden where the single payer healthcare system is responsible both for the intervention but also all of the time that somebody is off of work afterwards. And the more that they look at the effect of the entire, you know, care cycle on an individual patient and the costs associated with that, the more minimally invasive surgery as a replacement for open surgery becomes very cost effective. So they've got the highest number of robots per capita of any place in the world in places where they can really look at the costs from end to end. And we've got hospitals in the US that are buying six and seven robots. And they're not doing it because it's a marketing gimmick. They're doing it because they can reduce the number of post-operative beds that they've got, and they can increase the throughput of people. So they don't get paid any more for doing a robotic surgery, but they are reducing enough costs that they are getting a positive return on investment. Um, this just a comment, the panel, uh, uh, has uh, sort of revealed a flaw in robots. If questions aren't directed to the robot, humans don't engage. I don't Do people get what that means? I've got a few one. people on that question. I would, I would just, uh, maybe they mentioned, you mentioned flying robots. I, I, would, I would also mention as a different thought is, you know, uh, UAVs, drones. You don't often think about drones in healthcare, but there's many folks thinking about using them to deliver drugs and vaccines or if you crash your car to deliver a medical kit. So uh, I think I heard the word flying in there. So just maybe think that we're expanding our, our thinking of, of robotics to flying vehicles and they'll play a role in healthcare as well. And if I was to make a little scenario for the future, if in 10 years we have telepresent robots in our home and we have companies like Doctor in Demand, you may simply press a button, have your um, clinician appear in your home, you'll augment it with things like, you know, it's tricorders like the scanner do scout, et cetera, to augment your exams and you'll have the drone then deliver your drugs from the local CVS, all with a, you know, in a 10 minute window. So maybe that wraps some of these things together. And then the empathetic drone to uh, bring you coffee or tea or uh, <laughs> give you a massage. Your massage chair is probably robotic now, now too. Um, Corey, where is Autumn today and how successful has it been to help people lose weight, manage, manage weight? So our new company is Catalia Health, and what we're really focused on is building a platform for long-term behavior change. And our partners are uh, healthcare entities that are interested in augmenting what they can already do around behavior change. So we're building applications with these partners for helping patients at home manage activities of daily living, uh, helping people take medications. Uh, so the focus right now is on building out some of these new things where we can show a much more clear ROI uh, versus the weight loss coach. 
Uh, okay, getting back to s robotic surgery, um, do you have any comments sort of about using Google Glass in surgery? Um, I, have a, I have a good friend who actually did quite a bit of uh, pioneering work in that. She's a trauma surgeon and has been wearing Google Glass in a lot of her surgeries. I think anything that is going to bring additional information to the surgeon or is going to be able to, you know, I'm confused by this, let me take a picture, let me send it off to somebody who I can call a quick consult on. And then, uh, you know, while I continue, they can tell me additional information. I think all of that is really great. It's, it's a way of digitizing open surgery in a way that we do in robotics, but uh, we'll never get away from open surgery and trauma surgery and things like that. What about med school? Uh, is this all being sort of some of these things being taught in, uh, in medical school now? I think we're starting to blend, you know, the, the digital divide. Half of the physicians practicing today grew up on the web. Half are still, you know, pre-web. And I think, you know, at Stanford, all our medical students get an iPad their first day of school. So they're starting to learn and become educated on the, in a digital sense. And I think maybe the next generation will be training. Obviously, at Stanford, we have a sim center where it's partly elements of robotic training to, to stimulate uh, surgeries or other interventions. So I think there's a whole need to revamp and rethink how we do medical education, particularly because the role of the clinician is going to be melding with some of these in new ways on the traditional four-year education path. We can, we can potentially be disrupted significantly. Uh, can you speak to pricing? Robotics are offered, we talked a little about this, but they're offered at a high expense based on the hypothesis that they're much more effective. What about cost-benefit analysis that examines incremental improvement? And I would also ask, what do you guys think about the scaling of some of these, uh, these technologies? Well, so the cost-benefit analysis is often done in different countries by a health technology assessment group. And essentially, the measure that they're using is uh, dollars per quality adjusted life year is a very common thing. So if you want to say, I have an intervention and somebody is going to, you know, their, their life will be 50% better after the intervention because they're very ill, and then, or we will extend their life by another 20 years, what's that worth to us as a society? And by, by, by looking at lots of interventions from vaccines to surgical robots as a, you know, sort of what's this net effect in terms of dollars per quality adjusted life year, this is the way that you can make decisions, especially in a single payer healthcare system, about what technologies you consider are cost effective and which are not. And so um, robotic surgery has actually been examined by health technology assessment groups all around the world. And it's being adopted in countries where they follow their health technology policy. Um, what we were looking at in the UK was it was about $7,000 per quality adjusted life year, better than doing open surgery. And the cutoff in the UK for services that they will provide is about 30,000 30, pounds per quality adjusted life year. So it was actually one of the more cost-effective technologies that the National Health Service covers. So um, it's easy to focus in any technology on the money that it costs when you bring it into the operating room or into the home. But when you're looking at the downstream effects, when you're looking at the entire effect on the patient, you have to look at all the costs that it displaces downstream. And so anybody who is working on making a new medical device or a new kind of an intervention has to be thinking about how is it cost effective? How is it bringing more value than it is bringing cost? But the, that calculation can't be done right in that initial interaction. They have to be done looking at the entire patient. We have to wrap it up. Uh, Daniel, uh, do you have any closing thoughts? Anything you want to add? Um, how does it, what's uh, it like to be on that end today? You were here yesterday. And <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I just would say that I've used this sort of technology now maybe for 12 different hours in meetings and interacting with folks, and it becomes really quite easy. I think we'll blend this with things like Oculus in the future, and, and part of the theme, I think, of this conference and others is that the future is coming faster than you think, um, that we should think about how to leverage these um, in novel ways and make these platforms, and, and robotics, again, I would sort of, blend with the whole idea of, 
of augmenting us across the healthcare spectrum, whether that's the AI piece, the augmented view piece, the, the ability to have uh, more specialized and focused therapeutics. And um, uh, give us a try. I'll, I'll, I'll come down after the break and I can meet and greet people on this too. So thanks. Great. Anything else, you guys? All right. Well, thanks very much. Corey, one more thing. One last thing I was going to say is, you know, I think that right now all of what we're doing is still fairly unique and novel. And so we end up here in a panel on, uh, you know, robots, Dr. Droid. But I think that's going to change drastically. In the next few years, each of us are going to be representing more the health outcomes that we're striving to achieve rather than talking about the technologies. You know, we haven't had a panel up here on people who are using computer chips in whatever application they're talking about. And I think as Daniel said, this is changing quickly and it's not going to be very long before we forget that the underlying technology here is a robot, but we're talking about what the actual outcomes are and how we can you know, help patients live happier, healthier, longer lives. Mm -hmm. So the chips could be next year. Okay, <laughs> thanks very much. Thanks for the questions. Okay.